Oh boy, here we go. It is the finale of Final Fantasy Ultra Champion Edition. Let's take a look at our characters. You can see I'm at level 42, and you may be wondering, why so high? Why so high? You're always so overleveled, dude. What are you doing? I try to make these uh, crawls of longer dungeons, especially when I'm playing them, for the first time as smooth as I can and as quick as I can and that's just a lot easier if my levels are higher so um, if you're wondering why I'm, I'm so over leveled this is much higher than I would normally go to on a casual playthrough if I was just exploring and poking around but because I like these series to be informative and not overly long I try to uh, save some time on camera by grinding off camera if that makes any sense we get the um, little item get uh, fanfare there when I cross the, the threshold behind uh, where Garland was hanging out. And it actually caused the music to glitch out until I talked to the bats. This is uh, just documenting what the bats say. Basically the same thing they said in the NES version. In fact, it might just be verbatim uh, from the English version. I, I don't remember exactly uh, what happens. But basically those are the Sky Warriors from the past. And when the four orbs are lit, they are able to speak. And here is the text. You put the four orbs over the black orb. And now to take a step forward is to take a step back in time. Yada, yada, yada. So this is the TOFR, the Temple of Fiends Revisited. We are now back 2,000 years in the past, although we are still just a, just a quick uh, exit spell away from <laughs> being transported back out to, uh, to the surface. And as we'll actually also learn, we are just a quick um, set of stairs away from being transported back. Um, so already we can see here in the Temple of Fiends Revisited that we have some new monsters, some tougher versions of the old Ochu type enemies, the Morbles. And they have pretty decent defense. They have some status attack stuff that's, uh, that's kind of yucky and a lot of hit points. So already the monsters here uh, getting tougher. Some of the notable monsters in this dungeon in the NES version or the vanilla version, the unhacked version, uh, would be the like set of four gas dragons, which can all do the poison ability on you and can do, you know, 300 or so damage to all of your characters or more in uh, in the first round of battle. So it's a, it's a tricky one to run into. Uh, and in the Temple of Fiends Revisited, the way it works in the vanilla version, it's kind of, it's a mild maze. It's a mild maze where you have to walk from the ground floor up to, I think it's the third floor, then back down to the ground floor, and then into the basement. So they kind of extend the, extend the dungeon by, uh, by very smartly using the limited floor tiles that they had, where you have to go up to the third floor, that's where you fight the phantom, and then you can, um, play the loot to break the the seal and work your way your way down so if you didn't get the loot at the beginning of the game you're uh, you're stuck so the phantom is just a kind of a nasty eye or beholder like enemy that uh, will that does a lot of instant kill stuff so it's kind of meant to drain your resources towards the beginning of the dungeon so we see a reference to that though uh, where we go up to uh, this is the second floor not the third floor and also in the Temple of Fiends Revisited, there's some random and uh, not very useful chests with some gold in them. It, when you go back 2,000 years in the past, you can pick up some random chests with gold. Uh, I did not check those other uh, rooms over there to the left on this one, so I, I don't know if this one left the left that reference to the old uh, Temple of Fiends Revisited with some useless gold. There's By the time you get to this point in the game, there's really no place you can spend the gold, for one. You'd have to cast the exit spell to get out. Um, and if you're doing anything but a uh, really, really hurried run of this game, by the time you reach the Temple of Fiends Revisited, you have everything you need. You shouldn't be needing to buy any more equipment or spells by that point. Gold should not really be a problem. So we have some uh, some skull enemies, just some nasty undead. And uh, yeah, so at 42, level 42, I thought I probably would pick up at least uh, another level, maybe even two, just fighting some unrunnable battles or fighting some uh, some battles that I just choose to fight to demonstrate what they look like, but mostly we'll be running in this one. By the way, when it comes to longer videos like this one, might I recommend watching it on uh, Fast Forward here on YouTube. If you are not aware of that, down with the gear icon, YouTube does have an automated uh, speed up and slow down feature where you can watch 
the video at up to two times speed, and it does not change the pitch of uh, the, the the music or the sound, so the my voice will not be uh, chipmunk squeaking. It will be uh, my, the regular pitch. These tricker enemies are uh, they're pretty nasty. They start spamming lightning elemental spells, uh, so they go bolt, bolt two, bolt three, kind of in that order. So if you let them hang around for a couple of rounds, you can really get crushed quickly. We run into them a few times before. But I would recommend on this one, if you uh, if you care to, if you're short on time, uh, go ahead and turn on that fast forward button. I do it with Let's Plays of slower paced games like this. Also feel free to use the uh, navigation shortcuts that I'll put in the description of this video to, uh, to various important moments of the run where I'm running into uh, some of the later bosses, and if you just want to skip maybe right to the chaos fight, just find those quick links down in the description of the video for your convenience. I do that on longer videos. So uh, we've made it down into the basement. This would be the, uh, the earth floor, the earth floor. So the, uh, the, the layout of the, of the Temple of Fiends, we did not quite go up to the third level and then back down to the ground floor and down. It looks like we went to the second level. By my count, we went up to level two around the, the edge of the castle, back to the ground floor, and, uh, and now we're in B1, which is the earth floor. Although uh, we've got nine dark elementals here, and I'm going to fight this battle just to kind of showcase what these, those look like and uh, what a battle can be down here. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering how I got to level 42, it actually was very quick and very easy. I will send, put a note about that in here. I went back to the what I earlier called the Southwest Castle. It's the castle that's straight south of Melmond that has the, uh, the key items down there. Those are optional key items in this version, the chime the rod, um, the cube, those, those kinds of items that in the vanilla version are important uh, key items. You notice Pearl there does 510 exactly to our Darkness Elementals. 510 is uh, 255 times 2. 255 uh, is the highest 8-bit uh, number. It's FF in hexadecimal. Um, and most calculations on NES games are done between 0 and 255. So you actually have 256 values but 255 is the highest one going from 0 to 255. Anyway, the battle that I fought to grind up was in the uh, in the floor where the cube is hidden, where the futuristic uh, Leffianish person tells you that about their cube. Um, that cube is protected by a battle of four Magitex. They look like Warmex. They're just sprite swaps of Warmex. Uh, the battle gets you about 8,200 experience. The battle itself gets you about 8,200, and that's for every character that's not divided. And uh, that much gold also, by the way, if you still need some gold. And uh, those battles were pretty easy with this party. They lasted three rounds almost all the time. Round one, I had my physical fighters attack. My cleric would cast uh, Wall to protect from the uh, bolt beam and ice beam attacks that they uh, start spamming. Uh, and then my sage would cast haste two for my, for my fighters. Round two, the fighters would usually finish off one of them just with, with sheer damage, and then my cleric would cast soft, which is the petrification spell, and uh, those magitex are susceptible to uh, being petrified. So usually in round two, two of them would go down, and then in round three, the other two would go down to damage and to uh, soft. So I could fight those battles very quickly. Here is this stone plate on the floor, and this is just like in the earth cave where you use the rod, but the rod doesn't do anything. Okay, plate is still there. I'll try the chime. Chime does not do anything. It just gives the description. And I played the lute, and there I get the jingle. Normally, we would have played the lute in the in the vanilla version. We would have played the lute earlier. That does not uh, take the, the stone off of that uh, warp tile. But I happened to see on the, uh, the walkthrough series. That's also linked in the description uh, done by the author of this patch, the walkthrough series, which I would also recommend you watch if you want a little bit more technical information about this patch. Um, that the, the warp tile to where we're going, and I won't give it away if you don't know already, is over here to the left. So if you're wondering why I'm fighting these sandworms, it's that they are unescapable battles. One of the few unescapable battle sets here in... Uh, Final Fantasy Ultra. And if you're wondering uh, why I'm burning up my spells on an easy battle like this, well, we'll find out pretty soon. 
So you can see uh, Esper doing much, much more damage now with the ability to, to use Haste 2. Haste 2 is a fantastic spell in this one, especially given the number of hits my characters get. So there is a warp tile. You can see we're in uh, a, a dwarf cave looking place. There's a little door uh, tile glitch there. Those happen sometimes in uh, in hacks. So there's an inn right there and it costs 7777 7, 7 to stay at that inn. There's an item shop. And need I remind you, we are in the Temple of Fiends Revisited. And yet here's our item shop. And look at, I'm buying soft potions right here in the middle of the Temple of Fiends Revisited. Uh, now this is a, a bold design choice, but to, what it kind of helps with is letting any party get through this one. Uh, the vanilla version, uh, any party can get through and even solos can get through, uh, but it really can be a, a grind. It can be kind of a luck fest. It can be really nasty. You can even buy, look at this, uh, we have magic spells here and a clinic. But it can be really difficult with, uh, with certain parties. Throwing these in, and of course the items are protected by being on a hidden island and uh, by some tough battles to get to these little towns in the middle of, of the Temple of Fiends Revisited. Um, I presume those stairs, by the way, go out to the world map. Those stairs are a... Uh, actually, I know they go out to the world map. Um, so I did not take them, did not try them out. I'm not going to... I'm going to try my, my hand at these ones. No, I'm going to run away from this battle. And the Invis Ring will just help me from their attacks. Sorry about that. But what putting inns in there does is it makes this dungeon more accessible to other parties. And really opens things up if you're allowed to replenish, um, especially your spells. You're allowed to use your spells a little bit more, which makes it a little more fun. <laughs> it's one of, the, one of the limitations of this game is that your mages, you can't use those fun spells very often. But now, of course, if you have uh, dedicated casters, they get far more spell charges. I've got nine level eight charges with my cleric. So, you know, really, really, uh, I can throw those pearls around a lot if I want to. Um, but you can you can replenish. So now we can use some of those haste twos on random battles. There is a, the, the old one experience point zero gold battle of everybody escaped. And uh, just like in the vanilla version, Lich is protecting the steps by a trapped square. So... This is not a sprite-initiated encounter, so if you want to fight Lich over and over, you could. You could just step back and go in. So I can't go back and replenish after the Lich battle before I go on. Luckily, there is uh, an inn and a, and a town on every floor. So I'm putting up the wall spell. Um, the Lich used Comet there. Lich in the vanilla version. This version of Lich is... Uh, it's probably the toughest fight in the in the dungeon because Lich can use Nuke and has a pretty good chance of using Nuke on the first round. Um, so Nuke is non-elemental in the vanilla version, so it gets through all of your ribbons and any protections you want to put on. It's an all-targeting spell that just takes a ton of hit points from everybody, and there's really nothing you can do about it except just have enough hit points to survive it and then have enough healing to recover from it uh, when you go down to the fire floor. Now, luckily, the fire floor has some easier enemies, so you can use the heal staff and heal helmets to recover a lot of hit points for free, but you do have to make sure you have enough hit points to survive uh, those first couple of battles. So you need to bring yourself up with your very limited heal potions, and remember, heal potions in the vanilla version only cure 60. They, they, don't, they don't go for 100 or more. So it's uh, really, really a limiting factor, and without stores to rebuy them, in the vanilla version, you've got 99, and that's all you've got for the whole dungeon crawl. So you can see we're fighting, just like in the uh, in the vanilla version, we're fighting the fire elementals from way earlier in the game. So this is also a, another callback to uh, a much easier time. The earth floor in the vanilla version has uh, tougher stuff. It has some earth elementals, I think, but also like green medusa, like big groups of medusa enemies. Now here we have four holies. We did not see them back in the volcano. <laughs> but in the vanilla version... You're fighting stuff like red giants and fire elementals and agamas and stuff that uh, that's it's way below you. So you can take an take advantage of that, especially like an agama battle, and just sit there and spam healing items until you're uh, back up to full strength. So I'm not going to go on to carry. Carry is protecting the stairs, just like she is, or I think it's supposed to be Kali and it's supposed to be he, but I always think of carry as a she. Um, so. 
sue me on that, I guess. But uh, I'm gonna head over to find, I'm gonna try to unlock all of the, uh, the secret towns in the Temple of Fiends we visited here, even if I don't need them all. Now, I did not stay at the inn back on the Earth floor because I didn't think I needed to at that point, and, and sure enough, I've been able to uh, to handle things just fine on my way over to the fire floor here. And again, uh, I'll just I'll fight this battle with four holy elementals just because I'm about to replenish, and we'll kind of show you what they look like. So I'll use the, the haste two spell. See right now, Esper's at five hits, and that's going to get doubled. Sulla I think is at seven hits, so that gets doubled to fourteen when they all uh, when they all land. And we'll go ahead and put up the invis two spell to try to get these holies to miss a little bit. They're uh, <laughs> so far not missing. But I, they're only landing one hit, so it's not too bad. I don't know if elementals ever get uh, multiple hits in uh, in this form, in the human forms. I know the the time and darkness elementals do get lots of hits because they have a status attack, which we'll see some of those later. They have like a status attack sleep, I think, or status attack darkness. Heal staff gets us some free healing, and it also just kind of burns an action uh, from Zonk. Probably because I'm going to heal up, I could have just used Meteo or something to, to speed this battle up a little bit. Here we're going to demonstrate the power of soft again. If you haven't seen it, um, soft in this version functions as a uh, restorative spell out of battle. Um, of course, curing petrification status. But in uh, in battle, it is the petrify spell, and it allows a white magic user to really be a very very efficient um, battler <laughs> because it can just one shot many many enemies are are susceptible to it, and its accuracy is pretty high. In, at least in this version of the hack that I have. I don't know if anybody would call that OP. I don't usually comment on, on OP or balance issues because I'm not an expert in it, but it is something that I have used a lot to great effect. So here we have a castle-looking tile, and uh, it's an interesting there how uh, the author of this patch worked in kind of a, a warp tile there that so sounded like it was an invisible door, that as I uh, stepped out of it, it made a door-closing animation. It looks like when I warped in, it the game registered me as being in a room because I could see the other rooms, the inside of the other rooms. Because this game is kind of funky with um, with rooms, the, the rooms where it has a white well, the kind of the white ceiling on it so you know they're black or they're white they're covered up when you are not in a room there's the steps going up to the world map again by the way so if you did want to warp out right here you could and I'm just gonna walk out of this castle um, animation not an animation just walk out of this this castle tile and that brings me back so you, you have steps going up to the world map and again uh, 2,000 years forward in time we won't we won't worry about the timeline because the authors of the original game did not really worry about the timeline so we, I don't think we need to worry about it here in 2017 so here's another uh, holy elemental battle but I'll just run from that one again just to save time I don't really need the levels obviously don't need the gold even with the in costing seven 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 seven. You see, I have several hundred thousand gold, and that's from uh, from battling all those Magitek fights at uh, 8,000 each. They were uh, pretty good, even with me buying some level 8 white magic for Esper there. And here's Carrie again. And uh, n they're not renamed in this one, and uh, I'm not entirely sure if they are a different enemy set. I wasn't paying close enough attention to their hit points um, or their, uh, their, their AI routines. I wasn't really watching closely enough for that. In the original game, they are different enemies in the uh, in the enemy table, with different amounts of hit points and different moves. That's why Lich is so dangerous using Nuke. Um, but there are alternate versions of all four of the fiends um, in the bonus dungeons already. So I don't know if the uh, the author of this patch um, included an extra one here, or if these are just copies of the old fiends as we fought them before. Doesn't really matter. The flavor of the uh, flavor of the game remains. But we did fight an alternate version of Carrie already. I think she was uh, Seraph. The alternate version of Carrie was Seraph. So there's Fire 2, though, but again, we're protected from her uh, from her elemental stuff by wall. The you know, my invisible stuff will help me on that. So now we're just on to attacking. We've got haste 2 and everybody. Uh, big damage coming from all those characters at the top. And you can see Esper there, the, the paladin, swinging that hammer 
really doing a nice job doing a lot of damage with haste two on and i'm noticing i'm getting a lot more experience from these boss battles than you get in um the vanilla version from the second boss battles which that what makes me wonder if maybe they are just copies so i can't go there there's a stone plate and i do need to remove that so i'll find which of the key items will uh will open that up for me okay not the chime and there's the rod so the rod does open up this one so I can walk in, and this one has the Sea Shrine tiles. And again, it had me in a room, I think, when I came in. It registered me as in a room when I came in on the submarine there. And it is it is neat to see that submarine sprite used one more time in this game. Of course, it's used uh, in the town of Onrak, and then it's your entry and exit. That little sound hiccup was me making a save state, so I'm going to try these stairs to confirm that they go out to the world map. And indeed they do. The, uh, this time it was stairs going down. Um, but the, the stairs are just to, just to show you that they go out to the world map and we'll just bop back to uh, the save state. So normally I don't use save states uh, in the middle of a Let's Play video. I normally do not use them. I try to make these as smooth as I can. But I did want to demonstrate that without having to uh, do all that work again. I would have had to fight uh, Lich and Carry again to get down here and go all the way through all those floors. So... Obviously, was not going to do that on stream or on camera while recording. So we're on the water floor. This is uh, so white sharks and big eyes, and I can't remember if, if the white. I think the white sharks are are the gray sharks uh, from the vanilla version. They're just boosted up. The big eyes can do some status stuff. That's why I chose to use the the wake ring from my sage. Now the great marble definitely should have just taken my chance to strike first and just gotten away. Should have just gotten away. But I thought, oh, I got a chance to strike first. I will just fight this one and see what happens. Um, that was a, in hindsight, definitely a mistake. Because even with the big damages uh, we're doing, this thing has pretty good, uh, pretty good defense and very, very high hit points. The sleep ring. I thought I would try the. Uh, normally, these kinds of enemies are immune to statuses like that because they, of course, are the status machines. But I kept thinking that, oh, my Viking will do enough damage in a couple of rounds. We'll take this thing down to level 42. Look at that. So, I mean, this this has taken 3,000 or more damage already, which is more than Chaos has in the vanilla version of the game. Chaos famously has 2,000 hit points in the vanilla version, and Warmech only 1,000. Warmech is in this one, by the way, as a rare encounter. Um, I'm not hunting it. Now here's Hex though, and Hex is a nasty one. Hex is a nasty, nasty one. Because it applies the uh, multiple statuses, and uh, kind of uh, most notable among them is Silence. And again, uh, it's, it's easy to forget in this one that, whoops, characters are silent. When they have multiple statuses sitting on them, they usually only displays one of them, and the game prioritizes poison. So if you're poisoned and something else, generally it just prioritizes poison to display. But these guys are also, uh, some of them are sleeping, and some of them are uh, muted as well. So when you see somebody skip a turn, it's because they're still asleep. And now Hex is just reapplying the sleep status as it comes up. So in the... Uh, in the routine for the Great Marble there, Hex pops up in the spell list, it looks like, twice in a row. So this is probably one of the toughest random battles I have uh, I have fought. And again, I should have just run away during the chance to strike first round, which is a guaranteed escape. And I probably should have started attempting to run away around here after this thing has taken, what, 5,000 um, damage? I, I'm not counting carefully, but uh, I kept keep assuming that, okay, well, this round will just take it. Surely this round my, my Viking will take it out. Um, but again... Everybody silenced. There's not really much I can do. There's Hex again, so it's going to take our turns away from us. Even with the uh, waking up from sleep, which usually happens very quickly. You wake up from sleep on the next one. It was kind of a famous bug in the old game that uh, sleep would never last more than one action. That uh, sleep would always wake up. So stun was a lot more uh, effective to use, and uh, it was a lot more annoying to be used against you. And there, finally, with 7 hits, 1083 damage, uh, Sulla takes takes out the marble. And 4,000 points of experience is, is pretty nice down there. And uh, the Purge spell in battle will restore everybody of poison, but outside of battle it works just like a, uh, like a potion. 
and just restores one, so it's not worth using all those charges. So I'm going to use some of the charges of my lower uh, tier heal spells. I won't use heal four on this one. Just trying to get through to uh, <laughs> the next inn. Just trying to get through to the next inn, so I'm going to cure myself up. Have to use some potions, and that's okay. I have plenty of potions. And, I, and uh, a note on the menuing, much like uh, speedrunners in the NES version of the game to save time, I made sure before I came down here to use all of my saving and resting items. So all of my tents, all of my cabins, all of my houses are, are gone. So the menu brings up the the cure potion to the front. In the NES version, unfortunately, all of your key items sit up at the top of your menu and the cure, cure potions sit down at the bottom, but speedrunners will manipulate their inventory so that they can get to their cure potions quickly, even though they're not going to be right at the top. This patch, one of the many things that it fix, fixes, and a lot of patches of this game make this change. It's definitely called a fix, not a change in my opinion. Um, if getting your cure potions, uh, your heal potions moved up to the up to the top of your menu. So you don't have that loot sitting up there all the time. So you can just hit the A button once to get access to your healing items. And you're not continually playing that loot throughout the game as you're mashing the A button uh, in frustration. Because <laughs> your key items get prioritized to the top for whatever reason. And I don't know if that was just a laziness move. If they just didn't bother to, uh, to try to make your menu more user-friendly. I guess someone could ask uh, Nasir... And see what his uh, see what his thinking was. Anyway, we have ice elementals here, and we're just gonna take these guys out because again, I uh, I presume that I have a battle with uh, Kraken waiting for me, and then I'll have access to another inn on the next floor. Uh, Kraken is not right in front of the stairs in the NES version, and indeed in this version, um, Kraken's kind of in the middle of this hallway. So I'm going to heal up. I didn't know that for sure, but uh, it, I presumed it was one of the things that was left from the flavor of the old game. And I don't mind burning up a bunch of potions here because I have 70-something cure potions. And uh, I don't think I will need to use even close to all of them. So I can be pretty liberal with those. I'll stay at the inn to uh, restore my spell charges, but I want to make sure I had my higher level cure healing spells because you would never bother with drinking a potion or casting a low level healing spell this late in the game. In battle, I mean. You would never bother with that stuff. Because the, the 100 points of healing in a battle is just not enough at this point in the game when some enemies can do, you know, multiple hundreds. So if you're ever having to use heal potions in a battle in the Temple of Fiends Revisited, um, you know you're in really bad shape. <laughs> and you should probably reevaluate where you are in the game. So, uh... Typical protections, trying to get um, some physical evasion up because uh, you can see Kraken there is uh, preparing itself for a massive physical onslaught with, uh, with hasting itself, uh, tempering. So I'm hasting my own characters, so haste and temper have been landed. So now I'm gonna, I am going to try to land slow on it to see if I can get rid of that haste. Um, but I don't know if, if Kraken is uh, susceptible to the that... The, the status of slow. That one definitely missed. Uh, I don't know again because it's immune or if it just didn't land. So there it did land a pretty big physical attack on Sola. Thankfully, Sola just narrowly survived. And uh, that's really good because Sola is my primary damage dealer. So uh, it's I probably should have... Uh, in, in hindsight, again, if I wasn't level 42, this, uh, you know, this would be a lot tougher battle. I don't really have to do too much of that stuff on this particular run through because of my my level, but so shells protected from elements. That's okay because I'm not going to be throwing bolt threes at it um, anyway because most of my damage is coming from Sola. But I should have moved Sola down to the to the bottom tier to protect him from getting getting attacked. Um, you know, Esper can can absorb a lot of physical damage. I probably should have moved T Hawk maybe up into that. Uh, second spot, because Tiok can also can absorb a lot of physical damage and has almost as much HP as, uh, as Sola does. And it would not be the end of the world if Tihawk got nerfed in the second or third round, but Sola, this would make the battle last a lot longer. So there's level 43. Again, when you fight these monsters in the vanilla version for the second time, they're only worth, I think, like 501 experience. They're, they're worth kind of a weird number that does not 
line up with their difficulty. And here's uh, the time elementals, and I think we've seen these before in the time tower, which is one of the four bonus dungeons, and they have multiple hits. You can see eight hits, and eight, thus, eight chances to uh, land the status attack sleep. Now, thankfully, they attack Sulla before Sulla's action on that round. So Sulla was able to just wake up immediately. Now Esper loses uh, his next his next round. So I'm going to go into uh, spellcasting mode because the uh, I believe there is an inn waiting for me down where the Masamune used to live. Of course, I've already picked up the Masamune and I'm carrying it around even though it's useless to this party. I just could not could not bring myself to drop or scrap the Masamune. There's Pearl, and Pearl is uh, doing enough damage to bring them all out. So Pearl's a really nice... Oh, almost. I just got one left. Uh, Pearl's a really nice one. It's just It's like the Holy spell. Fr or the... I'm sorry, it's the Fade spell. Excuse me. It's Fade in the, uh, in the NES version. I'm not sure where they got... not sure where they got the Fade word. That'd be a good question for the localizers. Because I'm assuming that in the Japanese version, the word was something like Holy... Uh, but there was probably uh, concern about using anything that could be perceived as religious. Um, so maybe using the word holy was, uh, or anything anything that could, could be spiritual at all, even though holy doesn't really necessarily uh, point to any one branch of, of religion, or even necessarily to uh, anything... And anything from the real life spirituality. It's just kind of vaguely spiritual in itself. Anyway, this is the Phantom. I did attempt the Life 2 spell there. I just wanted to see if the Phantom was susceptible to the uh, to the undead kind of stuff. And Phantom is a is a is a kind of boss, as we talked about before in the vanilla version. It sits on a uh, a spiked square in the Temple Fiends Revisited uh, in the castle part. Before you get to the earth floor, you have to fight a phantom. And uh, I noticed that that phantom actually gave us a decent amount of golden experience, unlike the vanilla version where it just gives you one. One gold, one experience. So it's worth nothing. And uh, it's kind of just basically there to try to kill off one of your characters or two of your characters if you're unlucky. Um, in the Temple of Fiends and kind of force you to use a life spell or I mean basically force you to start the dungeon over if you're if you don't have a character that can cast the life spell you might as well reset unless you're I mean unless you're very very well prepared you know unless you're very well prepared but it's early in the Temple of Fiends revisited so it's really generally if you're playing casually worth just resetting and restarting the dungeon so it's just meant to be kind of an annoying barrier to make you use a life charge or reset because it does have uh, instant kill stuff. Now here the phantoms, after I have uh, cast wall, are able to, uh, they can use their death and stare. Now death probably kills a stare. I don't know if that's a petrification uh, ability. I don't know. Or if that one is also an instant death. But they can use stuff like XXXX. Um, and stuff like that. That's XXXX is a threshold spell, so that's one of those weird ones that hits anything under 300 hit points. So it's not really a um, a normal accuracy check. It checks your hit points, and if you're low, it hits. And that works, by the way, going from your characters to the enemies, or from enemies to your characters. So uh, if you maintain a good amount of hit points, and I think Lich 2 maybe casts XXX also. So Lich 2 will will cast Nuke. Um, and then XXXX, which which is a really clever um, it's a clever move on the part of the designers of the game. If they really wanted to make sure they got somebody, you use Nuke first to almost ensure that uh, they'll be below 300 hit points, and then uh, hit them with the uh, Threshold spell to definitely take somebody out. I can't remember if that's uh, how it goes, though, with Lich 2. Because I play ROM hacks of this game so often, it's it's a lot of it gets conflated in my brain. A lot of the kids kind of mixed up as to what's uh, what's where. Because I don't play the vanilla version as often as I do these these changes. So here is the um, the Sky Palace town. <laughs> it's the town in the sky. And I'd like to know uh, what this innkeeper does in her spare time. Because uh, presumably she has a lot of it. She's living 2,000 years before the present day. There's a warp tile pointing up. If you've noticed in the... In this, in this, the dungeon tiles there, those warp tiles that are the stairs, they are pointing up and down, so you do have an idea of where they go, so you don't get totally lost. 
So up is the steps going up, and then down is the steps going back down. So, uh, but anyway, I did not have to use um, another item to get there. I didn't have to use another item to open that one up. So I'm not sure if, if all four of those items were supposed to unlock something. I think I just used the, uh, the loot in the earth floor. And it unlocked not the not the one it was sitting next to, but another one. Here's a random battle, by the way, with Ogo Pogo. Now Ogo Pogo was the souped-up version of Kraken in the bonus dungeon. So we have a random battle, and I know it's a random battle because I went. It's not a spiked tile square, and obviously it's not sprite initiated because there's no sprite there. But it's just a one tile wide. Um, it looks like a set of stairs, although, of course, the perspective is not a staircase. But I think maybe that's the design choice they were... The, the message they were supposed to send was a staircase, but it doesn't quite work, and maybe I'm making that up. But anyway, that is not a spike square because obviously I did not run into Ogopogo on my way down. So this just must be the one of the rare <laughs> encounters. I'm At least I'm hoping it is uh, encounter number 7 or 8. Uh, counter number 7 is 3 out of the 64 battles in the table. And then counter number 8, I think, is 1 in 64. We talked about the battle table in uh, an earlier one of these videos, in an early version. I think it was in the Holy Shrine, when I ran into two Holy Elemental battles in a row in the uh, in the step table. So uh, maybe we got lucky here that Ogopogo is... Uh, Maybe is our 3 out of 64 or 1 out of 64 battle formation on this on this floor. And as you can see already, there's just there's lots of phantoms. Lots of phantoms. So Ogopogo's doing the same thing where it's kind of buffing its physical attacks up. I'm using the spells because I'm already planning on just going back to that inn and uh, restoring my spell charges. Because I presume that Ogopogo is unrunnable. It does still give me 10,003 uh, points of golden experience. So that's nice. The When you fight the souped-up version of the fiends in the uh, bonus dungeons, they give you 10,001, 10,002, 3, and 4. So that's a nice touch, and I did get that again. So that is a, the same Hogo Pogo. And now it's going to be back to the phantoms. So it looks like most of the battle formations are on this floor are 1 to 2 phantoms. Uh, but then maybe we do have a rare encounter of Hogo Pogo. And who knows, maybe other uh, souped-up versions of Fiends will show up. But I can generally take these Phantoms out uh, in, in a round or two. The Will Ring, I uh, should note, I picked up uh, not recording. I picked it up because I missed it in uh, the, I think it was the Time Tower. I think it was the Time Tower. Um, but I missed it when I did my, my recording. It was pointed out to me by the author of this patch who has commented on all of my videos and I've pinned his comments because oftentimes they are, well not, all, not oftentimes, all the time they are very informative and usually answer a question that I maybe pose while I'm doing commentary. So I like to pin those, so do read those. They often give extra insight if you're, if you're not going to be watching the walkthrough series that he created, at least read the comments on this series. They're very informative. So he pointed out to me that I missed the will ring. A lot of things are pretty well hidden in this game, but not so much that you can't get to them. I just didn't go on... I thought I had gone up one path that I did not go up. So I went back and got the will ring. Will protects you from uh, effects. It says defend effects, and I think what it does is it protects you from the, uh, the elements of status, the element of poison, stone, and maybe the element of death. I'm not sure about the element of time or if, that's, if the element of time maybe has been taken out of this one. But it just def it defends against status attacks, basically. Uh, and I'm just presuming that it defends against those elements because they're in the vanilla version of this game and the way this game works, um, status is actually an element. They, there aren't elements and statuses. Um, things that are applied are of an element. And so if you can defend against the status element or the death element or the earth element, then you can uh, just resist things of that element coming in. So Will helps you with that, and then um, Shell helps you with the damaging elements, Fire, Ice, Lightning. So Shell helps you with the damage elements, Will helps you with the other stuff, and then Wall does both. Wall does both. And Wall is actually really nice in this version. Normally in the vanilla version, Wall is a level 8 white spell, and it applies protection from all 8 
elements, just like your character wearing a ribbon. So it basically gives your character a ribbon for the duration of the battle that they're in. And here's the Iron Golem, the infamous uh, 1 out of 64 <laughs> battle. They're a very, very rare enemy in the NES version. But uh, I've noticed on the, on the commentary of the walkthrough series that they have been made much more common in this one. But uh, the Iron Golem and the T-Rex type enemies, by the way, are both very, very, very rare. And if you watched AGDQ 2017, there is a run of Final Fantasy 1, uh, a very interesting co-op run by both Fiesel and Gyre, two notable speedrunners of Final Fantasy 1. Both of those gentlemen are very knowledgeable about this game and uh, came up with a marathon-safe co-op speedrun that was very entertaining. And uh, that was one of the... A trivia question came in as to which enemy was the most rare enemy of Final Fantasy 1. And uh, Iron Golem and T-Rex both are 1 in 64 encounters that only appear in, in one uh, tile set. So a neat little thing there. So I would recommend watching that, the Final Fantasy run by Fiesel and Gyre of AGDQ 2017. So here is Tiamat 2. Um... Standard set of defenses. This party has been very versatile in terms of defending. I can set up the wall spell um, to defend against uh, elemental stuff coming in. Tornado, I think, might be non-elemental in this. I'm not quite sure. Uh, physical attack there, pretty nasty, as you saw. Um, so I'm just kind of keeping the hit points up, even using the heal staff once in a while, just to save myself using a couple of the potions that I have plenty of anyway. So we're going to be heading to the final floor. And the final floor, I do not point it out here, but it's available in both the walkthrough series and in the uh, the walkthrough available on the readme of this patch. Um, that you can run into random encounters down here, and the random encounters are the fiends from earlier in the game, so the bosses from earlier in the game. Uh, but the encounter rate here is extremely low, so you have to walk around a long time on this floor to uh, to do it, to find one. So I'm not going to bother hunting anyone down <laughs> on this floor. I'm not going to try to run into a... Uh, a, another Kraken, or a, I ran into the random Ogopogo, so I, I'm going to call that good enough for um, for random boss hunting. So I'm just preparing for the chaos fight, and uh, here's Garland again, and I believe his text is just the same as it was, and uh, he just steps back just as he does. So not much changed right here. He talks about creating the time loop by sending the fiends from the past to the future, and they will send him back to the past, and yada, yada, yada. It doesn't really work, but uh, but hey, here we go. Now, Chaos does, uh, just as in the NES version, have Cure 4 in its spell routine, but Chaos has both abilities and spells, and abilities um, get, uh, get checked, and so it's using abilities more than it uses spells. Um, so in the NES version, you have to watch for it to use a couple of spells, uh, and Cure 4 is its fourth spell. Uh, slow 2 is right before it. So when you see Slow 2 pop up, you know the next time it uses a spell will be Cure 4. Um, so I'm kind of toying with Chaos here to see if we can get Cure 4 to pop out. Uh, so I'm just going to be buffing a little bit. Notice that uh, Bind Ring lowers the, um, the evasion of Chaos, and I actually did get Bind Ring to land once. <laughs> Sulla, the Viking... Hold on to the bind ring, which I have not used very often um, recently. Esper is just boosting uh, his attack power. We're all haste tooed. Uh, bind ring misses there, but I did get to land the first time. And so once we get the wall spell up and invis two up, we're protected from everything unless chaos uses. And I don't think Exfer is a spell in this one uh, or dispel. Uh, I cannot remember if it has popped up. Uh, but that's one that I've used to to hilarious effect in one of my playthroughs of Final Fantasy Restored. When I was the four white mages in Final Fantasy Restored, the dispel spell was pretty cool because I got some late game bosses to run away from me. So that was fun. Do check that out elsewhere on my channel. Uh, tsunami is an ability, I'm presuming. Because spells in this game are spells that you can use. I don't think I don't think any enemies, at least in the vanilla version, have any spells that aren't also available to you. So they have a spell list and an ability list. So Chaos can do either a spell or an ability or a physical attack. So when it uses an, an ability, it doesn't progress the spell list. It just progresses the ability list. So it goes down the list in order. Um, so in the vanilla, vanilla version, Chaos uses an Earth Elemental Instant Death spell called Crack. It's not a spell, sorry, an ability called Crack. And usually that pops up first, and that can happen in the first round. 
Um, tornado, I think, probably, and Tsunami are probably references to Chaos's ability called Swirl in the NES version, which I think is just a non-elemental area of effect damage thing. That's It's threatening, but it's not all that nasty. So, but I'm watching Forecast use spells, and I'll know it's a spell if it's something that I have been avail that's been available to me in the white and black magic shops. And I don't know where Cure 4 is going to pop up on the spell list. So here's an attack just to kind of see from Sola. And as you can see, Sola doing over 2,000 damage um, just on my test attack. So I'm very happy with, with that. So I know when I do go full on the offensive, um, I should be able to really pile the damage onto Chaos. I'm going to do a test spell of Pearl, a, a test casting, just to kind of demonstrate how much damage that can do. Uh, probably should. I don't know if I should have done that with Zonk too to kind of demonstrate. Zonk doesn't have any of the high level single targeting stuff. I invested rather in the area of effect stuff. Now there's another 14 hits for 2500. And there's another Tsunami. So uh, Chaos kind of staying in the ability list and staying out of the spell list. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I just decided like I'll just fight. I'll just see how much damage I can do to Chaos. I'm not really, I'm kind of just in a holding pattern now. I'm not really doing anything useful. So even using the heal staff in the final battle. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can get Cure 4 to pop up. There's Tornado again. So Tsunami and Tornado, as you can see again, Chaos staying in the ability list. And I think, I think abilities get checked first. I can never remember without looking at the algorithms guide if the game checks for abilities or spells first. Because uh, it does prioritize one or the other because it checks to see if it does one first. And if it does that, then it stops. It doesn't check it anymore. But if it doesn't do uh, the first one, then it goes to check to see if it does the second one. But I always forget which order it goes in. I sound like a noob with this game when I say that on uh, on recording. That's okay. So there's Hex. Now, Hex could have been a lot worse than it was, yet it still hit Zonk there uh, through my wall spell. So I'm not quite sure what happened there. Wall... Um, as I know it, walls should protect from, from hex landing because it should defend against all of the elements, uh, at least as I understand it. So I don't know if we're running into the, uh, the calculation error that sometimes pops up in the vanilla, vanilla version. And there's Chaos Dead, by the way, 3,000 damage from Sola. We did not see Cure 4 pop up. But Hex did land through walls, so I don't know if if maybe the defense works differently or if this one still has the same very small chance of things getting through, like the, the 1 in 201 chance of, uh, of stuff landing even when it should be immune. Which is how uh, a, a tool-assisted speedrun can get Chaos to run away from the party, because uh, you can get Fear to land on Chaos if you can uh, hit it with that, uh, with that very exact... RNG manipulation that you couldn't really do with as a human uh, player, but with the TAS, of course, you can. Any things are possible with TAS. So there it is. The time loop is broken, and we are going to watch the epilogue. So that is Final Fantasy Ultra Champion Edition. I will not be chasing down Warmech or Pink Puff. Um, you can find those videos in the walkthrough series done by the author of the patch. I feel like the game's been completed for me. I've tried to show off as much as I could and give you my thoughts as we went along. This is a very, very fun patch, but definitely recommended for someone who has some familiar familiarity with the game already. So uh, get yourself going with Final Fantasy 1. Learn the systems, learn the spells, learn the monsters, learn your route through the game, um, and you'll have a much more fun time with this one. This one will be a lot more approachable if you have that experience, but if you're watching this, probably you do have some experience with Final Fantasy 1. I, I hope this is not your first experience with the game. Go watch that speedrun at AGDQ 2017, by the way. That'll give you a really nice introduction to the uh, systems of this game, more than you could ever know. Um, also, the names of my characters were named after notable Final Fantasy 1 contributors, Esper, uh, Astral Esper, Zonk Miles, ZZONK Miles, um, and then T-Hawk and Sola, both uh, Final Fantasy 1 players who have done challenge runs and write-ups. So there's Sarah and Jane, uh, Princess Sarah and Jane. Now that changed, yeah, the, uh, in this one, there's, uh, there's not a king in this one. I think we have uh, a couple of queens, so that's interesting in the beginning. Check that way, way, way back. Everything went mad and day has the interestingly translated dialogue at the end, but definitely this one is worth a worth a playthrough, worth a checkout. Um, get in touch with the author of the patch; you'll see um, his comments down below. He's a very cool, very cool guy, and I definitely thank him for putting this together. I had fun playing through this one. 
it's going to go up there in my uh, my top Final Fantasy one patches, and I will keep playing more and more as we go through on the channel here. But I'm always happy when I can close off another one. I will let the uh, epilogue play out to its conclusion. If you did like this video, do, though, do hit that thumbs up button. It helps more people find these videos. Subscribe if you want to see more of these come up. Check the history of my channel if you want to see more of this stuff, by the way. There's plenty on here. Um, and get in touch with me on Twitter where I am, active underscore ATE. Leave me a comment. I always love to hear your feedback. We will see you next series.